Hello, dear viewers. We welcome you to this latest edition of the News in English on Rwanda Television. My name is Serge Shinhori. As always, we will begin with the headlines. Survivors of the Marburg virus disease here in Rwanda are urging members of the general public to adopt a habit of hand washing frequently, not just during epidemics. The Office of the Ombudsman has given the Rwanda Development Board and the National Agricultural Export Development Board a three-month deadline to secure an investor for the Kigali Silk Factory, which has been inactive for the last four years. Now the details, I'm glad you are able to join us. Dr. Francoise Nizeimana, who once suffered from the Marburg virus but received medical care and recovered, advises that although Rwandans should not panic over the disease, they must remain vigilant, especially by fostering a culture of cleanliness as it has been proven to help prevent infectious diseases in general. We have the details on that. Nizeimana, a critical care physician, contracted the Marburg virus after initially losing a close colleague to it. You understand that there was sadness, but mixed with fear because of the thought that I could be next. It was difficult, but I knew I had to be strong. The fear she felt was justified, as she was later diagnosed with the disease herself and found that she had also infected her husband. I began by shivering, the way a malaria patient might, and by night I had developed a fever. Then my joints began to hurt and so did my temples. My husband also got so sick, I prayed for him. The day we tested positive for the virus, we began taking medication. That's how good the medical assistance we got was. Dr. Nizeimana and her husband spent 15 days in the hospital under medical care. She expresses deep gratitude for the care she and other Marburg patients received and considers herself fortunate to have recovered. Because trauma was such a concern, psychiatrists were always on hand. We also got injections once a day to fight the virus, and we were required to drink a lot of water. We were also given very good food, a balanced diet, and all patients were able to eat as much as they could, depending on how sick they were. Now fully recovered, the doctor is ready to return to her work in both medicine and education. I am eager to return to work because being a doctor is a passion that I cannot imagine not doing. I forgot to tell you that I am also a university lecturer and in the near future will be giving exams to my students. In addition to international organizations commending Rwanda's response to the disease, Dr. Francoise and Nizeimana also praises the support they received from the country's health officials. I am very grateful to all those people at different levels of administration for the effort they put in to stop the virus from spreading while treating the sick, the majority of whom recovered. As a physician, she emphasizes the importance of cleanliness, especially the critical role of hand washing. All people should strive to wash their hands often, not just when epidemics and pandemics break out. Menlas Cheshimana, doctor on the team monitoring patients in Marburg treatment facilities, notes that those who recover from the disease will continue to be followed up on for over a year as they may experience mild residual health issues. Some visual disturbances may arise, and measures exist to ensure that they get the required treatment to protect their sight in general. There is also a risk of chronic fatigue developing, and if that does happen, rehabilitation will be necessary. Long-term joint problems are also a concern. So is complications in the muscles, and of course there is the psychological factor and the very real possibility for depression, so that too must be monitored for. The Ministry of Health also urges those living with Marburg survivors to avoid any form of stigma, as those who recovered have been thoroughly treated and are capable of resuming normal activities. Additionally, the Ministry reports that there are currently three patients receiving treatment and that there is hope that they will recover soon and return to their families. 
As we noted in the headlines, the Office of the Ombudsman has given the Rwanda Development Board and the National Agricultural Export Development Board a three-month deadline to secure an investor for the Kigali Silk Factory, which has remained inactive for the last four years. We have more on that as well. Industrial Park. The gates of the Kigali Silk Factory, into which the government invested over 900 million northern francs, have been closed for four years. The factory, which is secured with chains and locks at the entrance, houses machines capable of processing silk from silkworms with a production capacity of between 70 and 100 tons per year. Pacific Mutaganswa, who was once the head of staff at E-Works, a South Korean-owned silk production company, recalls how over 3,500 farmers maintained a good relationship with the investor. The investor was very discouraged by the global economic crisis that was caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, and we understood that. We went for eight months with a full stock but no clients. Even after we closed our doors, we struggled on for the sake of the farmers that supplied us, and we had an agreement with Naeb that we would facilitate them, even after he works left, and I believe that agreement is still in force. To produce silk, silkworms require mulberry leaves for food, and farmers across the country were growing these crops. However, due to the inactivity, the farmers have now repurposed their mulberry fields to grow other crops. Growing mulberry plants was not helping us because our children were becoming malnourished, and so we are now growing vegetables. The mulberry plants were dying in the fields because no one was buying them. The mulberry plants were no longer profitable, especially after the departure of developmental partners. We have no one to buy our leaves, so we decided to grow food crops instead on a rotational basis depending on the season. We even had the Minister of Agriculture come here and tell local leaders to support us to grow food crops instead. The Ombudsman's office has instructed RDB and Nayeb to find a new investor within three months. Chief Ombudsman Madeline Nerere urges farmers not to uproot the mulberry plants they previously cultivated and to remain patient while a new investor is sought. The advice that was given was that RDB and Nayeb find another investor so that the farmers can resume their supplies. We gave Naib three months to give us a progress report on that issue for another investor to be found. We therefore urge the farmers not to uproot their mulberry plants because we believe that a new investor will soon be found. The economics expert Stratohab Jarimana believes that if this project had been carefully planned, the losses incurred by the government and farmers could have been avoided. He suggests that those who initially cultivated mulberry should be provided with some form of support to keep them motivated. Develop strategies uh, on how you will mitigate any risk that might arise. And one of the risks that was uh, really foreseeable was um, uh, the private enterprise not being able to run the, 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 the infrastructure established by the government. And in this case, there should have been a strategy to say what if the private entrepreneur is not, does not have the capacity to run the enterprise. So this inc includes, for example, how fast are we going to replace the enterprise which, which is running the, the, the infrastructure. I would suggest, for example, if the government wants to continue with this industry, uh, to compensate, to to compensate the, the farmers for the losses they made and encourage them actually to continue uh, cultivating so that uh, the, the, the industry, when they, it gets a new, uh, a new operator, at least they know that they can have the raw materials from everywhere in the country. From 2011 to September 2024, 152.3 tons of silk have been exported from Rwanda. Between 2019 and 2023, silk production generated more than half a million U.S. dollars in revenue for the country. A total of 379 families who were initially required to relocate for mining operations in Guimhavu sector, Kayonza district, have instead began receiving land ownership documents, except for 66 families who will be relocated elsewhere. These residents received their land titles after 
presenting proof that much of this land has been in their families since as far back as 1927. Hondo Cell is one of the areas with settlements affected by the relocation directive. Upon learning that the relocation decision was reversed, residents expressed gratitude to the authorities who advocated for their right to remain and facilitated the process to secure land documentation. Now legally recognized as landowners, they have started renovating their homes given that their properties have regained formal value. Kayonza's mayor has explained that the decision was made after authorities received the issue, that is reviewed the issue and determined that some residents were not, were not located in designated mining areas, though others in such areas will need to be relocated. The Kayonza district administration also warns against unpermitted construction stating that those who build without authorization will face legal penalties as demonstrated by the demolition of four homes that lacked proper documentation. The affected area spans approximately 8,000 hectares. Of the 379 families receiving land titles, 66 will be resettled because they are situated in an active mining zone within the villages of Muganza, Rguinghuavu and Chinihira. Now, Rwanda's justice system is increasingly adopting ad, uh, alternative justice approaches to reduce the backlog of cases in courts and to alleviate overcrowding in prisons and rehabilitation centers. This method provides justice without requiring conflicting parties to appear in court instead of offering a platform for mediation and mutual agreement. Alternative justice rooted in the Rwandan culture and tradition diverges from the court-centered approach introduced during the colonial period, which often involves adversary conflict and can sever pre-existing relationships between disputing parties. Well-known forms of alternative justice include gachacha and mediation councils, but new methods have emerged, such as family meetings, community gatherings, Fa uh, family friends councils, labor inspections, arbitration, mediation, and resolution based on acknowledgement of wrongdoing. Those, have, those who have engaged in this system reported to be highly effective. A resident of Nyakabanda sector in Kigali noted that a family dispute that had dragged on for three years was resolved in just two months, and all parties reached a harmonious solution with no lingering resentment. Emmanuel Maniragaba, who heads the reconciliation program based on acknowledgement of wrongdoing at the Supreme Court, affirms that alternative justice can be applied to almost all civil and criminal cases here in Rwanda. Currently, the alternative justice policy is implemented in line with laws and regulations established by the National Public Prosecution Authority the Ministry of Justice and directives from the Chief Justice. However, future legislation will further formalize this approach, enhancing Rwanda's ability to address justice-related challenges, and this has been confirmed by the Chief Ombudsperson, Madeleine Nerere. During 2023-2024 judicial year, 9,851 cases were resolved through alternative justice. The key to this program's success is that it remains available as long as the disputing parties agree on a mac uh, amicable resolution, even if the case has already entered the court process. Additionally, victims can receive compensation without needing to file a separate claim, unlike in criminal proceedings, which can be often very lengthy. Now, the residents of model villages in Nyagatare and Gatsibo districts, that's in the eastern province, have voiced concerns over the mismanagement of development projects, particularly those related to livestock, which has led to, dwind to dwindling resources and increased poverty. Local authorities have pledged to tackle these issues by increasing the budget for these villages and making administrative adjustments. In Yeshiro village, Tabagwe sector, Nyagatari district, 64 families were settled back in 2020 in a well con in well-constructed homes, receiving 64 modern cows, 1,400 chickens, half a hectare of farmland per family, schools and a health center. Today, only 12 cows remain, producing just 42 liters of milk daily, which are delivered to the Nyabitecheri Milk Collection Center. The village's 15 hectares of farmland are managed by their cooperative, though some residents report that they haven't seen proce uh, proceeds from this farming for some time. The poultry project ceased due to feeding challenges leading to residents to sell the chickens in Gatsibo district's Nyabi, Nyabichiri model village, that is in Kabarore sector, 44 families were settled six years ago. 
The original 44 cows have now dwindled to just eight. 36 either died or were confiscated due to mismanagement. The provided biogas systems have also stopped functioning and the market they were given has started deteriorating without being used. Residents attribute these issues partly to their own mistakes, but also to inadequate oversight from their local leaders. Local authorities in both districts are seeking, are actively seeking solutions. In Yagatari, the leadership of the residents' projects has been restructured. <coughs> Excuse me, restructured. While in Gatsibo, authorities have continued increasing the budget for the village. Observers suggest that empowering residents to solve some issues independently could be valuable as some seem to rely heavily on the government to address each and every challenge that they encounter. Now let us go to sports news and day two of the KCB East Africa Golf Tour Kigali Leg came to an end on Saturday with the selection of four individuals will be representing Rwanda at the grand finale in Kenya in December this year. We have the details with William Evans Mutabazi. With over 200 participants, day two and the last day of this golf tour began with all participants putting their best foot forward and eyes on the day's award and a chance to qualify for finals in Nairobi. After almost eight hours of stroking the golf balls, players and some of the fans turned up for the awarding ceremony in a glamorous twist. We had more than 250 golfers participating and all competing to represent this club at the regional level in Nairobi. Uh, and we had uh, four golfers that emerged winners. So when they go to Nairobi, they will be challenging other golfers that are coming from other markets that KCB are operating. And uh, uh, we hope that the representations that we're sending to Nairobi, they'll be able to bring us victory. The best lady golfer of the day shared with Arabia how she feels being selected to represent Rwanda in Kenya and what she's looking forward to at the grand finale. It's been a very amazing ride. If there's one of the best decisions I've made is becoming a lady golfer. So I'm so happy that I won two beautiful prizes today. And um, yeah, as you can tell, it's so good to be a lady golfer in a country like Rwanda. Yeah. So one thing is to raise uh, the pride of Rwanda and also making memories and bringing the victory back home. <laughs> The managing director of BPR Bank Rwanda PLC said that as a bank, they want to look beyond the financial aspect of their customers to things like sports that bring a number of people together and is very vital for their well-being. Um, the reason why the, this partnership is really strategic is that we chose to be a corporate partner of golf across the region because we know the value that sports add into people's lives. Um, as a bank, we don't just look at the financial aspects of humans, but more about what is it that we can serve holistically, people holistically. And we know that sports is really important for the well-being of people. And so we promote sports as a strategic um, initiative and we'll continue to do so. BPR has been supporting the Kigali Golf Club for a number of years. We intend to continue supporting um, and, and extending the number of uh, people that benefit from this sport. So our commitment is to continue to sustainably uh, support this sport and look at ways where we can continue uh, together into a, a partnership that continue, can continue over uh, a number of years. The grand finale of this tour will happen on the 6th of December this year in Kenya where the KCB Stroke BPR Golf Tour Champion will be crowned. William Evans, Mutabazi, RTV News. Now we're starting the week. I hope your weekend went well and I hope the week ahead will be better. I'll see you soon. Goodbye.